Uh, I guess I'm the closer here. And I'm so lucky that I got to learn from all of you today and sort of reappropriate some of that. Are you guys OK to sit for another 15 minutes, or do you need a stretch? I'm a family doctor, and I still take care of patients. So I, I worry we just talked about stroke. I want you to get your, your bodies moving a little. If some of you just read my bio, you must be incredibly confused about why I'm here. I think whoever put this together took my clinical practice bio and put it in, and it says absolutely nothing about this kind of work that I do. So I was actually putting my slides together, and I thought I would give you a quick little about me before I start talking about what happened today. Um, this is an image of a much younger me in 1993 as I was doing my internship in Salinas, California, which for any of you who don't know really is the lettuce basket of this country. Uh, you wouldn't have things like artichokes or asparagus or celery or many other things, strawberries, if it were not for that region. Um, and I was working there as a very sort of idealistic young intern. Um, and when one day it suddenly occurred to me that all of the illness, all of the disease, all of the suffering, or at least most of it that I was treating in this community hospital, in some way or another could be traced back to soil. If you look at the map, that is uh, where the hospital is, surrounded by, um, at that point, which was mostly conventional agriculture fields. Uh, it was still at the time when organophosphates were being widely used. And I realized that treating farm workers, I was treating pesticide poisoning and herbicide poisoning. Um, I was um, seeing patients who were suffering from um, uh, misnutrition, which is kind of this new term we're using for too many calories and not enough nutrients from, you know, not have, being able to afford the food. I was seeing people who were suffering from poverty, from an agricultural system that was not giving them a fair wage. And really, pretty much everybody I was treating in some way or another had been damaged by the way that we grew our food. And so this has really informed my career, and I've spent much of my career, and I actually have a new uh, title or a, a new definition for what I do now. I, I'm a, a medical pedologist, I think. Um, and that I'm super interested in the connections between our health and soil health. And somewhat from a toxicology standpoint, and I am willing to talk about lead and toxins and all the dangers and all the horrible infections we can get and so on, but my real, um, my real aperture is through health, and how do we create a system which is pro-health and which can actually nurture us, since after all, food is sort of the number one thing that is supposed to nurture us. So, much of my education has not happened from my fellow physicians and has not happened from textbooks because if you go to the medical literature, all you read about is lead and tetanus and pesticides and so on if you put in soil health, human health. But it's really been from farmers who are trying to farm in a, in a very pro-health way. You can call it sustainable or organic or regenerative or um, you know, uh, uh, chemical-free or eco-health. They're all doing very different things. But what they all have in common is that they see themselves as on being on the front line of caring for their communities, of actually being primary care providers for their communities. And these are just some of the images of these farmers who really have been my educators. This is Karen Washington in the, Bro in the Bronx, and I, I guess I cut out some of the other slides. I was gonna go through a whole bunch of them. But what I found at the end of the day is that we have a problem, folks. And that is, as you know, and for the reason this conference was convened and has done, already doing such a wonderful job you know, and throughout the course of this day, we are stuck in these silos. And we're having a really uh, big challenge in terms of pushing this information onward because we really, really are stuck in the silos. 
Now, what I heard today, and it was a little bit like the blind man, the elephant, <laughs> um, is, you know, one group says, oh, the big link is nutrition, and indeed it is, and another says climate, and another says toxins, and then I heard microbes, and then farm workers or community, and all of these things are equally as important, so important, in fact, that I think we really have to start to thinking of them like this, that they're all intertwined. And that really is the only way that we can start to answer some of these questions, is not in that typical reductionist approach that honestly got us here in the first place, but starting to think much and more in a systems way. And if you all right, does anybody know what this slide, has anybody seen this slide, this picture before? It's here in Washington, D.C. You can go see it at the Freer Gallery. Okay, and this was the first bit of evidence that we have that we cannot be reductionist when we think about soil. Check out this little guy right here. Now, this is from the third century A.D., okay? This was actually for any, if there's any art history buffs in the room, uh, this was the first visual depiction of Buddha. And this is from the region of Gandhara in Pakistan. And this little guy, what does he have going on? He's got a goiter. What is goiter from? Iodine, Iodine deficiency where? In the soil, especially if you're very connected to the soil. Now, you could say, yeah, this is just iodine deficiency in the soil. But if you know about Gandhara in the 3rd century AD and even Gandhara region now, there's sociopolitical disruption. There's uh, the fact that it actually has very, um, it, 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 there's all kinds of erosion in different land formations that have gone on there. That they've had problems with um, um, a mismatch between the type of agriculture that they were doing even back at then and the demands of the soil. That there was, you know, uh, poverty and inequality and all of these other things. And so it wasn't just lack of iodine in the soil. It's a big, complicated mess, and we have to be able to approach it for that way, that way if we want to solve the problems. So we have to stop thinking like this. On the right is what we do with calcium deficiency in a human, and on the left is what we do with um, um, nitrogen deficiency in the soil. You can, you can just squint, and it's kind of the same. These, you know, these algorithms that we followed. Instead, we have to start to think like this. We have to start to think like the rhizosphere. Now, I am going to say something right now that might be very controversial and some people might run me out of the room, but I'm going to say that we don't need any big studies. That in fact, we already have the nodes of information and it's a matter of connecting the roots and starting to talk to each other. So, for example, this is a study that came out recently, really good study in PRJ, showing how much money you save per acre when you farm in a regenerative model and looking at all the inputs you save and so on. But there wasn't a single mention in the study of the money you save in terms of occupational health or human health or community health or all these other things that might help you save money. Here's another interesting study that's a qualitative study on how um, organic farmers have way less depression and way less suicide. By the way, you know, suicide among farmers is one of huge public health issue in this country. They're killing themselves more than dentists, okay? And that's, that's a lot. Um, and so what we need to start to do, who is going to take up the, um, this project and start to actually create the, the, the rhizomes or the roots between these two bits of research that we have? Or let me give you another example. This is a study that recently came out of China. Really interesting, following microbial communities from the soil to the wine, you know, looking at it in the leaf and everything in between. And then these are studies that are coming out in medicine looking at probiotics in randomized controlled trials and their impact on things like inflammatory bowel disease and irritable bowel disease and Crohn's disease and, and so on. Who is going to start to look at how these microbial communities actually can impact the human gut? Can I hand this off to anybody in the room? Any takers, any two people working on this that can get together over lunch and start to do this together? 
Or here's another one. I heard a lot of discussion today about urban farming. This is a study showing that urban farmers, or allotment farmers, as they're, shown in, uh, as they're um, called in Europe, are way happier, have less depression, more uh, social um, engagement than people who are not farming. Here's another study showing that, in fact, in allotment farming, there is much richer carbon stores. It, in fact, the areas where they're doing allotment farming in the UK, um, the soil is way healthier when they than when they compared it to the areas where they were doing conventional agriculture outside of the city. So there's some kind of restorative process that happens with allotment farming. Anybody want to take up this project? And can, oh, we have a taker over there. Thank you so much. I'm going to just continue on the, 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 uh, the um, auction block here. OK, this is a huge one. This was done by um, Dr. Mosafarian, who's the dean of the School of, Public, of, of, um, the School of Nutrition at Tufts. I know we have some people from Tufts here. And his group, I don't want to take away from the other people in the group. But basically, he's showing that type 2 diabetes, that one of the biggest exposures is lack of fruits and vegetables. We saw a wonderful presentation from Dr. Peters um, earlier showing us how little of fruits and vegetables were growing in this country. Here's another study on traditional grains and how, in fact, they've been shown to benefit people with diabetes and are hypoglycemic. Anybody want to take those two studies and put them together? And by the way, any takers in the room? No. By the way, in case you were wondering, foodborne illness kills 3,000 people per year in the US. Diabetes kills 100,000. So yes, I care about foodborne illness, but I care a lot more about diabetes. The foodborne illness costs us 15 billion. And diabetes costs us 825 billion. So where do you want to put your dollars and start to do things to change soil health? I had to put this in here because I was just at a conference with a man who has soil from Mars and is using it. If anybody, this is his name because we were talking about Mars and pills from Mars. Uh, I just had to throw that in there. So my appeal to you all is that we become rhizospheric thinkers and that we spend tomorrow really thinking not within our own little rootlet but within the rhizome. These are sort of shining examples of this. This is a study that just came out looking at farm level biodiversity in the Peruvian Andes associated with dietary quality and health. These are the kinds of studies to me that are very exciting. Of course, they're not huge modeling meta studies that encompass the whole globe, but probably a lot more useful in the long run because they're dealing with real things. Um, not all farming environments protect against weeds. These are comparing farming environments and trying to understand uh, how they impact children with asthma. Also, super interesting. And this is one by John Reginald where he actually studied the soil microbiome and then traced it up to the nutrient density of the strawberries that were grown and was able to make an association between microbial communities and strawberries. Um, so studies like that, I think, are rhizospheric. So, in closing, what we're trying to do here is not interdisciplinary, it's actually transdisciplinary. Interdisciplinary is this. It's a bunch of kids sitting in a sandbox, each playing with their own bucket in their own little thing, okay? This is transdisciplinary where they, they might not be making something that looks half as good, but they're all working on the same thing together. And of course, when you try and do transdisciplinary, occasionally this happens. <laughs> but um, some things that just to think about for tomorrow in terms of ways to do this work. Stuff you guys are already doing beautifully, but forgive me, I'm just gonna say it again. Listening, which is amazing. You guys all stayed here till, and now I'm running over and you're still listening to me. Ask how, which we've been doing explaining, we've been doing a beautiful job of that because you know what, jargon can really get in the way. And if you had more doctors in the room, they would have been very confused today because you guys did use a lot of jargon. Um, so, you know, really trying to um, explain and not use fancy words. Iterate, which 
forgive me because I think I've just repeated everything that you guys already said today, but you have to say things over and over and over again in different ways. Get creative. Make a new friend. Did everybody make a new friend today? Wonderful. And tell your story. I know it feels dirty as researchers to advocate or tell your story. It's supposed to be this pure thing and you let other people do it. But you, if we're going to move this forward, we don't have 10 years. You've got to tell the world about the exciting things that you're working on. And don't let perfection be the enemy of the good, please. So. I just wanted to show you quickly, these are some doctors and farmers that we put in a soil pit in California a couple of weeks ago so they could start to learn from each other. And they started to learn about you know, different farming systems. We have Jessica there in the front row who is uh, one of our teachers. And uh, we even started to draft a human and soil health declaration and I'm going to send that around to you guys, anybody who's willing to sign on. We really want uh, everybody to, uh, to sign on to this. And as you're making your friends and as you're inviting people from that other silo into the group, I just have one final little set of pointers for you so that you can have an easy conversation. Okay, you ready? Here's the first one. Really, in structure and function, we're exact, it really is pretty much the same. The microbes do the same kind of work. We have the same kind of layers, you know, hair, grass, big difference. You know, the rootlets are um, a lot like the pores. Or this is the villi in the intestine and the cross-section of soil. Once again, you know, nature, she's incredibly thrifty. She, if she's found a good design, she just uses it over and over and over again. Um, can you tell which one is the rootlets of plants and which one is the vasculature of the human kidney? No. Or this is on the microscopic level. Which one is the villi of the intestine interacting with the microbiome? Or the uh, rhizosphere interact, you know, with the, the rootlets of plants interacting with the microbes. You know why you can't tell the difference? Because, in fact, we pretty much are soil. Thank you very much. Thank you.